Good evening and welcome to election 2013. Uh, today is uh, Brockton Community Access and in partnership with WXBI Radio, our coverage of the mayoral election. Tonight we have the four candidates for mayor in studio uh, here at Brockton Community Access Studios and uh, we're gonna start right away with opening statements. Uh, we did a drawing for ballot, uh, uh, for order of opening and closing statements. And uh, first up for the opening statement is Ron Matter, you have one minute. Hello to the voters and thank to Brockton Cable Access for hosting tonight's debate. I want voters to know that I'm the only independent voice in this race. I'm not a uh, career politician and I'm not a city employee. I have been an advocate for the city for the past several years because I have hope for the future. Let me touch on my five point action plan. First, a job creation through public safety. Those two go hand in hand. The recent string of violence is a result of neglect. I am glad that District Attorney Cruz agrees with me that we are at the minimum, below the minimum threshold for police. It's a disgrace that New Bedford is spending more on police than Brockton. Second, second we will, uh, for, per the Massachusetts Department of Revenue request, I will develop a succession plan for CFO John Condon. Our city cannot afford to be run by an accountant. Third, I will give Rock Stadium to Brockton High and privatize the Shaw Center. The city has been funding the rocks for years, and it's time to cut our losses. Fourth, I will require Stonehill College to time. pay a standard storage rate. Time. Okay, we're going to go to the next opening statement. I got to keep to the time. Okay. Uh, next up is Mayor Belzotti. Thank you, Mark and Ron. Um, I'm Linda Belzotti, and I'm currently serving my second two-year uh, two term, and I'm running for re-election this fall. I'm running to continue serving as your mayor because I have a passion for our city. I'm a lifelong Brocktonian. I grew up in Ward 4, went through the schools, graduated from Brockton High, went off to Syracuse University, graduated and came back to Brockton because I love this city and its people. I'm running to continue serving as mayor because I have an experienced record of working to move Brockton forward. We have made progress in a number of areas over the past four years, prioritizing public safety, spearheading economic development, ensuring and building on the success of top-notch educational opportunities, and strengthening the quality of life in our neighborhoods. We've done this work, and we've kept the city moving forward during some of the most challenging times in our financial history. Our work isn't done, and I look forward to continue to working with city residents, officials, and businesses to ensure a brighter future for all of us and our families. Thank you. Um, next would be Bill Carpenter. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Carpenter. I moved to the city of Brockton 27 years ago. I've raised six children here in the city and now have three grandchildren and <coughs> three step-grandchildren. Uh, my oldest son, Bill Jr., is a Brockton police officer serving on the city's gang unit. My youngest is my only daughter, Delaney, who just graduated <coughs> from Brockton High School and heads off to UMass Amherst tomorrow morning. I've been active in many roles here in the city over the past 27 years. I've been involved in leading the effort to build new Little League fields at the Downey Elementary School, including the city's only handicap accessible Little League field, to being the radio voice of Brockton High football for the past 17 years. Completing my second term on the school committee uh, as chairman of the facilities committee, I have been involved in the reconstruction of the Plouffe Playground on Plymouth Street, uh, overseeing the renovation of Marciano's statue, I was checked at Marciano Stadium, uh, and also involved in the renovation of eight schools, a $36 million project that only cost the taxpayers $7 million. Time. Next is Chris McMillan. Good evening. My name is Chris McMillan. I'm currently the Ward 7 City Council for the past eight years. My approach to being the leader of our city would work the title, not wear the title. My common sense and no-nonsense approach addressing the issues would be summed up in first, would be first, public safety would be my top priority I acknowledge the need to increase police presence along with modernizing our equipment. Uh, second would be approaching the city's budget and spending, the real fis uh, spending with real fiscal responsibility. Uh, as Ward, Council said, uh, Ward uh, City Councilor, I recently voted no on the mayor's budget, uh, which again included a real estate tax, which is unacceptable. Furthermore, I feel that your tax dollars are far too more important to be placed in the hands of someone with, who has proven with fiscal, who's been fiscally irresponsible with their own personal finances. In closing, I have proven experience as city council for the past eight years. As chairman of the past city council fiscal committee, uh, finance committee, I have the intimate knowledge of the city's budget where improvements must be made. Also, as council president in 2010. Thank you. Okay, first question um, 
will be from Ron, and I'm going to keep reversing the order of the questions just to keep it fair. So first up on this question will be uh, Chris, Mc, uh, Chris McMillan. Ron. In regards to public safety and crime, what is your formula to combating crime in the city specifically? We need to be more aggressive. We have to have the uh, personnel in, in the right positions as far as the uh, shifts go. Most recently, we had a, a depletion of uh, police officers on, on the targeted shifts. Um, they were supposed to have at least, uh, I believe, six, six, six officers on Friday night, um, six officers on Saturday night. That was depleted down to two and two. Those are the extra officers for the impact shift. So I'd make sure that we would make, uh, put our personnel there. Uh, they're modernizing our equipment far as, as far as the shot spotter goes. Uh, we need uh, more of those to, det uh, to de detect where the, uh, the, sh the shootings are coming from. Reach out to the youth. Um, we, I'd like to start up a youth camp program with the city police officers to have to make sure that the youth are friendly with the police officers. Community policing is a must, again, and increase the walking, uh, the beat walks with the community police officers. We must reach out and connect with the residents. Thank you. Next up is Bill Carpenter. Well, I think in my administration, we would see a very different approach to uh, tackling the crime issue in the city. It would be a neighborhood approach. Uh, I will relentlessly, aggressively pursue every gang leader, drug dealer, and thug that's on the streets of our city and get them off. Um, we will do some real community policing, which means every single police officer on the police department is involved in interacting with the community. Um, we'll increase staffing. I, I keep hearing the number 187. I believe there are 176 police officers in the city. And it's great that the state police have come in, but they're only here because we're in trouble. Uh, according to a recent survey, Brockton is the second most dangerous place to live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, more dangerous than every other city in the Commonwealth other than Chelsea. Uh, this has to change. I will pursue aggressively drug dealers and gangbangers, and we'll get them off the streets. Okay, next would be uh, Linda Belsai. Uh, we have taken a zero tolerance approach to uh, violence. We have um, 12 officers who will be coming out of the academy shortly. We will be hiring for and more. We have a partnership with local, state, and federal law enforcement. We have state police here on a regular basis as we do representatives from federal law enforcement as well. We have funded foot patrols. We have, um, we have currently 170 officers. We <coughs> will have 186 by the time the uh, people are out of the academy and our new hires are done. We have had um, hired new cruisers. We have done a number of um, gun and drug sweeps. We have some more coming up. And I just want to mention that um, when we get statistics from the police department, uh, crime against people is down 18% um, overall. Crime against property is down 14% overall. So we are making an impact, and we are doing a number of things with our young people, uh, safe and successful youth initiative, and um, through the gang. Okay, Ron? Uh, yes, uh, I, I've been saying for the past uh, few years that uh, we need more police on the street, and I'm glad I, that my opponents are finally realizing that we have a problem. It's a result of neglect year after year, and I feel that we need to hire more policemen, and we have to do everything we can to put them on the streets. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, put them on the streets, like, uh, and so that they can have a uh, rapport with the people. I think that we need to hire at least. We should have at least 250, and uh, even uh, district attorney crews agreed with me. We are a minimum level, uh, we're, we're nowhere near the minimum level of police that we should have. And I believe that we, sh we have to do everything we can to, to have a full police force. And I will work for that end. Okay, thank you. Is there any need for, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to follow up, everybody gets another minute. So, Bill. Yeah, just a couple of follow-up points. Um, you know, the, the nine murders, 50% more already this year than last year, are making the headlines. But I think it's critical that people understand the daily violence that's taking place in this city. Just in the past three days, just in the past three days, two people have been shot, three people have been stabbed, a woman has been violently raped in Snow Park, and another car was riddled full of bullets with no victims found. That's just in the last 72 hours in this city. We need to take our neighborhoods back block by block. I will come in 
high visibility. We will do saturated law enforcement in targeted at-risk neighborhoods, and we will bring in all of the forces. We will use uh, counterterrorism techniques that have been used in Iraq. We will gather ground intelligence, identify the gang leaders, extract them from the neighborhood, get the guns and drugs off the street, and then come in with all the other city agencies behind them, clean up our neighborhoods, allow people to be safe once again Time. in their own neighborhood. Linda? Yeah. We have been doing both a proactive approach in dealing with young people through the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, dealing with some of um, the most likely to be either perpetrators of violence or be victims of violence. We are using the uh, Shannon grant as well to beef up putting more patrols on uh, in terms of working and putting more officers on the street through overtime. We do have the state police in. We do have the federal government in. We've had five, six sweeps in the last four years. We have our uh, foot patrols on. We've put on new cruisers, and we are continuously working <coughs> to get into neighborhoods. We have a program called Operation Divinity, go out into neighborhoods with social work, a police officer, and a, a faith-based clergy. We have our street outreach workers, five of them going out and working with at-risk youth. We are in the neighborhoods. We are working with people. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, basically, we are, we're at minimum staffing level allowed by the federal, uh, our federal grants we have received, which holds nine police officers on that grant. So if we fell below 186, we would actually lose those nine officers from the federal grant. It's called the COPS grant. But we need to be more vi vigilant as far as police officing goes and reaching out to the youth, reaching out to the, uh, the people who are uh, basically uh, are troubled right now as far as the, uh, the, the uh, as far as the actions that they're doing, uh, as far as the crime and all that. It's, it's not narrowed down to one group. It's a, it's a, it's a host of people. But uh, we, we can target those people as police officers in the city. We need to be more aggressive out there. We need to be out there walking. We need to be out there talking with the police, uh, people. And uh, if, I, if I was mayor, I would actually have zero tolerance, which we have right now some tolerance we allowed. It's just, it's not, it's being acceptable right now by some people is just, just Brockton, and I will not accept that at all. Zero. Okay, Ron? Yes, this is all wonderful, and, and I, all these plans are great, but unless we have a full police force, which is 250, all of these plans are, are really uh, not going to be done properly because we don't have a full police force. We should have 250. We spend less per capita on police force than any other gateway city, and it's a disgrace. New Bedford has, spends more than we do, Quincy, Worcester, Springfield. They all spend more money than we do. We have to appropriate the money to put, 200 and, to put all those policemen on the street. I believe that we can do it. And until we do that, we're not going to have really a good crime stopper. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Brian? What is your position on the proposed Brockton Power Plant? Okay, and the order for that one would be uh, Linda Belzotti first. My uh, position has been and always and continues to be that uh, I oppose the proposed power plant. I have for environmental and for health reasons. I don't think it's in the uh, best interest uh, for those in the community, and uh, I oppose it. Okay, uh, next is Ron Matta. Uh, in fairness to the residents, I'd like to set the record straight. Mr. Carpenter, in your power plant propaganda video, you visited several power plants and you claimed to do your homework and that you said there was no problems in these plants. For example, over the past three years, there have been 12 major violations of the Clean Water Act at the Kendall Square Power Plant Station. The Kendall plant is situated within a part of Cambridge that has over 38% minorities and a three-mile radius of the facility. Did you know that, Mr. Carpenter? We're not, we're not going neighbor. back and forth with questions. You make your statement, and you can do it in a... Uh, can rebut. <clears throat> Keep going. Yeah. You visited the Maytap plant. It is situated in Dana Farber Hospital Complex in Cambridge. The proposed Brockton plant is 350 megawatts. Do you know how many megawatts there are in the Maytep plant? There's only, it's only a 36 megawatt peaking power plant that was grandfathered into the Cambridge in 1978. Time. Mr. Carpenter, you are next. Sure. Well, my position on this is often misrepresented, so let me try to make it clear. Uh, 
I've taken a fresh look at this. I've changed my position. I think it's time to negotiate with the developers of the plant to seek an agreement in the best interests of the residents of this city. There have been nine court decisions between the developers of the plant and the city of Brockton. Six decisions, three appeals. The city of Brockton, every single one of those nine cases has been either been resolved or decided in favor of the developers. Uh, 0 for 9 in court has been at a cost of over a million dollars in outside legal fees. Uh, I appreciate the fact that Mr. Matter uh, did take the time to uh, watch the video. And I will say, yes, I have. I have visited five different electric plants, gas-fired electric plants. I've walked the neighborhoods. I've talked to people nearby. And I have done my homework. And uh, I do not have health and safety concerns regarding a natural gas fired electric generating plant. Time. Okay, next is, uh, would be Chris McMillan. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I'm absolutely opposed to this power plant. I have been for the past eight years sitting as a city council of Ward 7. For, that, for, for the sole reason that it's, it's not a good uh, fit for the city of Brockton. Um, you, can, you can debate whether they're going to bring in more money. I see it as fuzzy math. Uh, the health and the welfare of the residents down in Ward 4 uh, mean more to me than, than it does for bringing in some income that is supposed income there. Uh, in lieu of taxes they're, cr they're coming up with now is one thing. That before it was just going to raise a, a multi -million dollars with, uh, multiple million dollars of taxes. Now I'm hearing in lieu of taxes. And what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's going to be an abatement on the taxes. So um, they keep on changing their, their, their views. Um, they're telling you what you want to hear. They're, they're, it's not going to be a, a cure-all for the city's uh, financial uh, woes. And uh, like I said, the residents in Ward 4 have put up with enough down there. The city of Brockton is not going to, as, as a mayor, I will not uh, tolerate that. Time. Uh, follow up on this. I know uh, at least two of you didn't finish. So, Ron, I know you definitely didn't finish. Uh, you also visited the Fall River Power Plant. And if you did your, uh, and you talked to a gentleman there who said he had no problem living next to a plant, I don't know if you did any further research, but in 2010, their, their company, parent company, brought the Boston Gen uh, Generating LLC filed for bankruptcy, something you are familiar with. Bankruptcy and power plants have a long history. Is that, was that in your video? I think you should have at least uh, let the people know the full facts. You said we should negotiate a form of profit sharing with the power plant. If Weymouth had a profit sharing agreement with this plant, what would have happened to the residents? What profits are left for residents with a power plant that goes bankrupt? The same thing that happens in all bankruptcies. The creditors are left holding the bag. This is a data technology and the residents of Brockton don't want it. In light of these facts, this really brings into question Mr. Carpenter's uh, credibility to lead our city. Time. Bill? Sure. I, know I visited a Dighton plant and a Dartmouth plant. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, Ron. The Fall uh, River plant. Well, Fall Mike, River Mike sit down plants. when the other candidates are talking. Right. Um, a payment in lieu of taxes is an agreement negotiated up front to cover taxes and fees to protect the city against an abatement situation so that we don't make the deal unless we're satisfied with what we get. The same with the water purchase. I would not make a deal unless it's a good deal. The only way you get a good deal is by negotiating from a position of strength. Right now, we still have a little leverage left to negotiate with. If we continue to play this 0 for 9 out to the end game and lose at the end, we'll have no leverage left whatsoever. Then we'll get something forced down our throats that we don't want. We have an opportunity to negotiate a favorable deal. Everyone wants to hire more police officers, but no one's got a plan to pay for it other than me. Water, sewer, electricity, between the water purchase and the taxes and sewer fees, that plant Time. will generate about $7.5 million Time. a year to the city of Brockton. Chris? And here we go. Uh, negotiating in lieu of taxes, and if they didn't negotiate correctly, and you've been, the city's been fighting this company for eight years. What company in the right mind would want to sit back and say, we want to partner up with you now? They're going to go, if, they're going, if, they're con if they convince, convince that they're going to come in here without, through the courts or by, by beating us down, then they, why would they negotiate, first of all? Second of all, if they don't negotiate with us, where is, this, where is the, the money coming from now? It's a bad situation for city of Rock, residents down there. It's not a good product for the city of Brockton. The same as the desal plants, not a good product to even purchase or, or to, uh, to acquire. So 
Uh, Lua taxes, negotiations, it's just a myth. Thank you. Okay. Hey, no, no comment? Okay. No, no, we're not going back. We're done with this question. Okay. Mayor passes. Next question, Ron. I ask the same question uh, just about every two years when I'm involved with these debates. Do you uh, feel that uh, you have or have proven to have the ability to run a large city with a budget of over $300 million? Yes. Uh, I've been a well, 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 go ahead, Ron. Yes, I've been a successful businessman. Uh, I have proven that I can run businesses. I have uh, business, biz, business uh, ability, and I feel that I am the best for the job. I have dedicated myself in the last few years to uh, study the city and what has to be done in the finances, and I believe that I do have the ability to run the city. Uh, <clears throat> I have, st oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Still have time? I'm done. Okay. Uh, next would be uh, Chris McMillan. Uh, absolutely, I have uh, proven that uh, I can run the city of Brockton as a city council, and we handle this whole, the entire city budget, which includes the city side, the school department side, and southeastern regional. Um, we've, I've been dealing with the city's budget for the past seven, eight years. Uh, I realized that we uh, actually had enough money this year that we didn't have to raise the taxes. That's why I voted against it. Uh, my formula that, I, that was a, actually approved by the ch chief financial officer were, uh, would have uh, caused the taxes not to be ra uh, raised. Uh, it's, it's not a 10-year cure-all, but it's a relief for the taxpayers and in the, in the uh, com uh, into the, uh, um, the, the businesses here in Brockton. So yes, I absolutely uh, have, know I can run the city in the budget. Thank you. Okay. Linda? Uh, yes. I have for the last four years presented four balanced budgets, preserved core services. We have repaved 35 uh, streets and roads. We've brought and filled uh, police officer and firefighter positions, purchased um, firefighter vehicles and cruisers, kept the uh, main branches of the library open, uh, worked very diligently to maintain our bond rating. We negotiated a, a contract with the um, employees to uh, provide health insurance relief. So we have done uh, a lot of work, and I believe that I do have the skills to run the city. The uh, city is solvent now, and um, I think we're doing very well, and we're getting um, more economic development projects moving every day. So I do believe I have the skills and ability to run the city for another two years. Thank you. Bill? Sure. Um, I think what we're really talking about here is leadership, the ability to lead and bring people together and work together to solve common goals. Uh, the mayor can't do everything themselves. The mayor relies heavily on advisors like the chief financial officer. The mayor also works closely with the city council. I've shown numerous times the ability to bring people together and get projects completed. When I was first elected to the school committee, I uh, led the way to rebuild the Pluff School playground down the street at the DeMello Park. I brought community neighbors, uh, various city agencies together. That park had been burnt out and vandalized with yellow police tape around it for over two years before I came in. I led the way to help develop the state's fourth recovery school. We uh, put together a group of people that uh, put together a proposal, got a $2.5 million grant from the state, and opened the state's fourth recovery school. And I've been intimately involved in four school committee budgets, three of which had major deficits. We overcame those deficits without hurting our children's education. Time. Um, any additional follow-up? OK, I'll let you go, Chris. My, my Chris first, and then Ron. as far as as, as far as uh, Mr. Carpenter running a budget, it's it's a chapter seventy money, and, and a ton of that, well, most of it comes from the state. So, we as a city side have to raise the revenues. We have to raise that. But with, with that said, uh, it's been eight years, uh, eight years, uh, four years right now with the current mayor, that we've been raising the taxes for, for on the backs of the city residents and the commercial uh, commercial owners, property owners. Um, I, again, uh, last year we uh, reduced the levy of the raising the taxes, which didn't, meant the taxes didn't uh, come up, uh, didn't re weren't raised as much. Uh, this year I come up with a formula, uh, which would take some of the free cash that we flow year to year um, to, uh, to use some of that and some stabilization money. We have the money right now uh, in, 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 intact to where we don't have to raise this, uh, the, this, uh, the, ra the real estate tax, excuse me. So we do have it. I have shown leadership. 
and I have found a home for the girls' softball, and we've, I've done plenty Time. of that. Thank you. Ron? Yes, I think we need real leadership, and I believe I can provide that leadership. I, I want to make the tough decisions. I will make the tough decisions as far as the police go, as far as uh, uh, the budget goes. I've proven that I can do this. I've been very successful with businesses, and I, I believe that I can make the tough decisions necessary to bring the city back to where it should be, and that's greatness. Thank you. Um, Linda? We have uh, balanced four budgets. We have utilized what every community utilizes, which is Proposition 2 and a half, which was created many years ago, and the individuals that created it knew that a community could not sustain itself on uh, zero tax increases every year. We uh, do have a stabilization fund, that is without question. However, every home, every person needs to have some kind of, of fund available for emergencies. That's what the stabilization fund is. If we have another bad winter, such as we had last winter, we will need to go into that for snow plowing. If we have an opportunity for a grant that might require a match, that money is available to do that. That money is available and should be kept available in order to prevent and protect the city in the event of an emergency, not spend it down so that there is nothing left there and we don't have any finances in an event of an emergency. Bill? Yep, I think I'm due a rebuttal, right? Oh. Yeah, I yeah. think I'm the last so one left. He's right? the last one on that. He's the last one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, some important points. First of all, the city of Brockton per capita receives more state aid than all but two other Massachusetts communities. We rank number three in state aid per capita. So we're getting more than our fair share of state money. We need to bring more sources of revenue into the city budget besides just state aid. Uh, in terms of school committee budgets, my first year in the school committee, we had a $16 million deficit. Chapter 70 money gets paid a year later. Every year with our growing student population, we've taken on four or 500 students per year that we receive no reimbursement for whatsoever. Uh, I am the candidate that has a plan to stop raising property taxes, to provide Brockton jobs for Brockton residents, and to get into the neighborhoods and reduce crime. Thank you. We'll go to the next question. Ron? How do you connect with the citizens as mayor? How do you know how they feel? How do you get the pulse? Okay, first up on this one is Linda. We have developed uh, several uh, ways in which we work with um, our community. Uh, beyond the fact that I, I go out and attend as much, as many events as possible in order to connect and meet and talk with people, we uh, instituted constituent hours that allow people to come into the mayor's office and have conversation with the mayor. We uh, redesigned the city website. We've uh, begun and improved the social media aspect of the city, creating not only a city Facebook page, but a mayor's Facebook page. We created a um, email newsletter that people can sign up for where we get information out to them. In addition to that, we created a city information line. Uh, but I think the, the best thing that we've done is create those constituent hours that allow people to come in and, and have a conversation with the mayor. Thank you. Next would be Ron Matta. Uh, yes, I believe that as mayor I, I would uh, have what I would call monthly uh, town meetings to listen to the people's concerns. I would do this once a month, maybe at like a junior high school. Uh, and I would listen to the people. I, I've been listening to them for the past two years. I know the concerns, I know how they feel, I know what they want, and I'm ready to, uh, to inter, inter, uh, ready to listen to them. And we only can listen to them if we, if we get out there among them. And I think one of the best ways is to have town hall meetings uh, once a month and invite all, all residents to come and ask questions, and I think the mayor should be there to uh, answer them and to, and to listen to their concerns and, and get them involved in uh, running uh, in, with ideas that can help the city out. Uh, I had a gentleman give me a couple of ideas. One was to uh, like put in a uh, swan boats like Boston has. We could put that in the park. Time. Okay, next would be Bill. 
I think what you're really talking about is a style of leadership, and I think mine would be uh, significantly different. I think that you have to be out amongst the community, all of the communities within the city. Brockton today is made up of a lot of different communities, and I think some of those communities are feeling as though they're excluded, they're not part of the process. You've got to get out of the office. The office door has to be open. You have to be out there talking to people. I think that's always been my style. I think I've been a very high-profile person uh, during my 27 years here in the city. I have proposed as mayor, I will institute something called Coffee with the Mayor. And that means that one day per month, I will open up City Hall one hour early. I'll have the mayor staff there. I'll have the coffee on. And any Brockton resident will be able to walk into City Hall, speak directly with the mayor, and, and have the mayor have a chance to uh, help people individually. And had this type of management been in place in the past, maybe we might have done a much better job on the water bills, and that fiasco would not have gone on for years before it finally was fixed. Time. And Chris? Yeah, I, I've been, as a council, been hosting ward meetings all along. I was, uh, I, I picked up on that um, when I first became councilor, realizing that my ward uh, hadn't had any ward meetings prior to myself getting in there uh, for a long time. So I started initiating the ward meetings, reaching out to the residents, getting their feel, what they want to do. But what the residents need to know is that City Hall is your house. It's not, gonna, it's not my house as a, as a mayor, it's your house. Um, open, open door policy is a must. Uh, I won't have just, a, uh, I won't open up for constituent services just for one hour a month, which is only gives four, uh, four people 15 minutes to vo uh, voice their concern. And uh, definitely, uh, the, Ron, I thank you for your town hall meeting, uh, which most likely you got off of my action plan because that put that up back in January, that reaching out to the residents, town hall meetings is a must. And that, that goes along with what ward councils do is, what most ward councils do is ward meetings. Thank you. Okay, and there's more time for this. Um, Ron, did you want to address anything more? Yes, I, I really feel that uh, you really have to get out among the people, not just for an hour a week or an hour a month. It has to, you have to be accessible at all times. You have to address the people's problems and listen to what they have to say. And I feel that uh, I've been doing that for the last two years. I have been talking to people almost daily, uh, listening to their concerns, and, uh, and trying to help them with their problems. Uh, I, I worked with the, uh, a lot of people with their bills. I tried to help them out, but City Hall gave us no, uh, <coughs> no results. They just let it, uh, the bills go out. They, they Still oh, have sorry. Yeah. When you hear the beep, it's 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I try to help the people. I've been doing this all along. Uh, we, have no, we have gotten no results from, from City Hall. They have not helped the people at all. And I feel that we have to help the people. We have to be subservient to the people and not the other way around. Time. Um, Linda? First of all, constituent office hours are not one hour a month. And we are available to people all the time, every day. We're out, I am out, my staff is out, we are available to people. We work with all communities. The uh, water bill issue and the bills have been resolved. Uh, we actually have new meters now and we're actually bringing and um, developing all the software so that that uh, situation won't occur again. But we are more than available. Everyone in my office, including me, um, we are out all the time amongst the public. And again, we have the opportunity for people to come in and we have instituted other ways in which they can contact us because many times people work during the day and aren't available to come in. So we have worked to make those ways available for people to be in touch with us and to help them. Okay, Chris just raised his hand and Bill will get a chance to. So oh, Chris. Sorry. It's is okay. It mine or his? Go right ahead. Mine? Yep. Yep. Reaching out to the residents is, is one thing. It's, it's, it's a given. But to treat them with disrespect as, as was the case in this water meter debacle is another. Um, putting liens on the property with these for, because of these water meter bills weren't correct was a huge mistake by the city, and it happened under this current administration. You can't put a lien on a property if you, can't, if you don't have an accurate bill. Uh, I was told that you have to do it because it's a state law, but it, only if it's an accurate bill. Uh, it hurt a lot of people during that time, and there's a lot of people that just gave up and just paid it off because they couldn't deal with City Hall. As a mayor, you're going to be able to deal with me. Uh, buck stops here as a mayor. I'm, the, I'm going to be the top person in the city, 
and all the department heads will be run by me, and I won't be run by the department heads. Thank you. Okay. Bill? Uh, sure. Uh, I've got to tell you, I've been out knocking on doors and walking through the streets of the neighborhoods of the city for the past five months. I think I've had a lot of opportunity to hear what people are concerned about. Uh, people are concerned about their property taxes going up. People are concerned about their property values going down. People are worried about their water bills continuing to increase. And it's true. The mayor did approve placing liens on the homes of hundreds of Brockton residents knowing that the bills were not correct. Uh, the people in the city are concerned about bringing jobs and businesses back to the city. Good, hard-working people are looking for work. Half the commercial real estate space in the city is vacant right now. And most importantly, people want us to make the streets safe. They want us to get the guns and the drugs off the streets of the city. I'm out there talking to people every day. Coffee with the mayor is in addition to everything else we do. I think we need a mayor who knows how to work with the office door open. And that's the type of mayor I would be. Okay, next question. The council and uh, the mayor's office in the entire city struggle often with decisions that were made well before anybody came on scene, such as Campanelli Stadium, the desal plant, Stone Hills water contract, and, and others, uh, dealing with uh, those controversies and those bonds. Uh, what are your views on those expenditures, how can they be solved if you feel they are a problem? First up on this is Bill Carpenter. Could you just repeat the part about which specifically, Ron? The, I heard you say Campanelli Stadium. Oh, what Campanelli else? Stadium for one, the desal plant water contract, things that we've entered into that have proven perhaps, depending on your opinion, uh, to be expensive. Well, I think first of all, Mayor Balzotti has been in City Hall for 20 years. 16 years as a councilor, four years as the mayor. So I think that uh, all of those things that you're mentioning she was involved in as a counselor. Uh, the desal water plant contract, a contract that Mayor Balzotti voted for as a city councilor. We're paying almost $6 million a year for water we don't need, don't use. We need to challenge that contract, litigate it, get out of it. And yes, I do favor negotiating the purchase of the plant if it's a good deal for the residents of Brockton so that the debt service, the bond of an obligation we already owe would be substantially less than the $6 million we're pay paying right now. Campanelli Stadium is soaking up all of our hotel motel tax. It's running at a huge deficit. It's being mismanaged. That should be an event center and a conference center that also happens to have a baseball team there. I don't think giving it away is the answer because we still owe a ton of money on it that has to be paid. Let's make it profitable. Let's get an investor in. Let's make it work the Time. way it should work. Okay. Linda? Uh, first off, in terms of the desal plant, it's hard to cover all these three in a minute, so I'll do the best I can. But we'll in terms of the, yeah. the desal plant, uh, at the time that I came on the council, we were faced with either doing uh, something to address our water situation or continuing a moratorium in which all development that occurred in the last 15 years you wouldn't have seen. There were three options. Uh, one was not going to be allowed by the state, the other was the MWRA, which the public didn't want, and the desal was the only one available where all of the cost of creating it and building it uh, would have been borne by somebody else at the time. So that is why we went with the desal plant. Uh, in terms of the rocks, we've, we've done what we need to do in order to keep that stadium lit because it's better to have a stadium right now that's operating. The current contract expires in March. There's no saying that we couldn't look and find other people to operate and, and improve on that. In terms of the Stonehill Agreement, we're currently in negotiation, so I have to leave it at that. Time. Ron? Yes, I have here a little article. Government-funded stadiums not worth price of admission. Public finance experts Roger Knoll and Andrew Zimbalist concluded no recent facility appears to have earned anything approaching a reasonable return on investment and no recent facility has been self-financing in terms of its impact on, new ta on net tax revenues. I believe we should, get, we should, give, uh, we should privatize the, uh, the Shaw Center, and I think we should give the, the, the Rock Stadium to the high school. As far as the uh, uh, Stonehill, I said before, the, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled that this contract would be broken with notice. I will. On day of my first day, of, I will write it, a letter to Stonehill saying that you will be paying the bulk rate in 30 days. The track contract is null and void. 
As far as the desal plant goes, it's not going to cost less money if you buy it. It's going to cost more. Okay. Um, end of that round. Any follow-up on that? I didn't get the Okay, Chris. Well, Chris, it needs his turn. Yeah. Okay. If you want, I can skip it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not know. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Uh, as, as far as, like, the Stonehill College, as the mayor alluded to, we are negotiating right now with them. They're willing to sit down with us. If they, if they were another entity that were not willing to sit down, then I would just send them the bill at, as a regular uh, sewer, and, sewer intake or <coughs> sewer customer. Uh, Campanelli Stadium it was a nice gesture. I actually was the 36th person to buy season tickets when it first opened. I had those for three years. Um, I thought it was going to be something really special for the city, but it just, it just fell flat on its face. Now it's a, it's a, it's a money pit right now. Um, it's true that we're using a hotel motel tax on this property. Uh, I'd love to see it turned around and market it a lot better and have someone else uh, take over the uh, Shaw's Center, uh, whether it be a restaurant or someone else to, to do that. So we can put at least that property, piece of property on tax row. Uh, the desal plan is a bad product completely. I would not even be willing to negotiate unless they want to give us, the, want to give us back the uh, pennies on the dollar. Thank right. you. Any other follow-up? Bill? Uh, well, first of all, in terms of the, the Stonehill Agreement, uh, Mayor Balzotti has been mayor for four years. What's taken so long to try to get this thing negotiated and addressed? Over the last four years, at 175 to 200,000 a year, Stonehill College underpays on their sewer bill. Uh, that's somewhere between a half and three quarters of a million dollars during the Balzotti administration. How many police officers would that money have paid for? So that does need to get resolved. And yes, I would start by sitting down with Stonehill and give them the opportunity to do the right thing, but they would understand very clearly in that session that if they did not step up and do the right thing, I would also move to terminate that agreement, let them figure out what to do with their sewage. The conference center, the Campanelli, uh, it needs to be a conference center and a special event center that also happens to have a baseball team playing there. Uh, it's very clear that the baseball team cannot support it. I would look for a private investor to develop a hotel and link a hotel with the conference center and get that thing running right. profitably. Linda? Yes. Uh, first of all, in terms of using the money collected from sewer fees in order to uh, fund police officers, you can't do that. It's an enterprise account. That money goes into the, uh, right into the sewer account and maintains the sewer plant. Stonehill has had a long-standing um, contract with the city that's been amended four times, most recently in 96. But you have to work with an entity. You, you have to have negotiations. That's what happens. That's part of it, and that's what we're doing. In terms of turning the stadium over to the high school, if we were to turn the stadium over, that we would have to pay back the $6 million grant that we received from the state in order to fund it. So that's just not possible. Ron? Yes. I wouldn't negotiate with Stonehill. The contract can be broken any time with notice. All you have to do is write a letter to Stonehill saying in 30 days the contract is null and void and you will be paying the full bulk rate. There's no need to negotiate. And Mr. Carpenter, uh, every carpenter needs an architect. And the way you talk, uh, I think your architect is Jack Units. Uh, as far as the, uh, the desal plant goes, we are now paying $6.1 million a year we are, uh, the plant is losing $1.1 million, $1 million a year. This plant is doing nothing. So that means that you have to spend $7.2 million a year to maintain this plant because it, it is doing nothing just to keep the equipment going. Time. We are now paying six point one. If we buy this plant, time. we'll be paying seven point two. Time. So it's going to cost Ron, more, time. a lot less. Okay. Uh, we're going to do one quick question that's not going to have time for follow-up or rebuttal. I'm just going to ask each one of the candidates to list their top three priorities. Just, the, just name them. Um, everybody has a minute. Um, we're going to start with Bill. Top three priorities. Me first? Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, that's easy. Number one, stop raising property taxes, bring revenue in from other sources to give real property tax relief to the homeowners in this city. 
Number two, bring jobs and businesses back into the city of Brockton. We've developed an anti-business climate in this city. We used to make more shoes than anybody in the world. We don't make anything anymore. Half the commercial space in the city is vacant. Our commercial property tax rate is too high. It discourages businesses from locating here. It discourages businesses from expanding here. And third, most importantly, it's time to make our neighborhoods and our streets safe. We need to get the guns and the gang leaders and the drug dealers and the thugs off of our streets, saturated enforcement in high-risk areas, bring in all the resources, add 50 police officers to the Brockton Police Force, and make people safe. S public safety affects home values. It affects businesses coming into the city. It touches Time. on all of these. We've got to make the streets safe. Okay, next would be uh, Ron. Yes, number one priority is public safety. Number two priority is jobs. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. We need to make the city safe before we can bring in businesses and jobs. We need to uh, make, make the city safe. And uh, in this case, then we can go out and uh, bring, uh, sell Brockton and bring businesses back in because Brockton has a, a great deal to offer businesses. We have a good transportation system. We have a good workforce. We have parks and recreation. Uh, so we have a lot to offer, but we're not going to offer anything until we make the city safe. And then we'll bring businesses in, which will bring in jobs. And, and the jobs will, will bring the whole, uh, people pride and dignity and, and be able to say, we're proud to be from Brockton. Thank you. Chris? Oh. Uh, my number one definitely is, and as everyone probably has said, and with all the council at large, is it's definitely public safety. We need to clean up these streets. We need to make sure that the residents feel safe in their homes, and we need to bring the pride back to Brockton. Second is the tax relief. As I alluded to before, I had a formula, I have a formula that would have re not raised the taxes this year. Uh, second was definitely to bring in businesses and, and uh, commercial properties, uh, businesses, especially to the downtown area. I have a plan for that. It's on my website at, at chrismacmillan.com. Uh, my action plan's there for anyone to look at. Uh, I, I'm proud of my accomplishments in Ward 7. I've worked with a lot of businesses there, the Westgate Mall. I've worked with uh, Northeast Electric, and now, right now, Crown Linus is coming in. So I've brought in a lot of business with the help of the business owners. Uh, we've brought in a lot of business to, to my area in Ward 7, so I'm proud of that. And as mayor, I'll definitely continue that throughout the whole city, especially the south side. Um, there came out. That's deplorable. Time. Linda? First and foremost is public safety and quality of life. So uh, we will continue to work uh, not only on the law enforcement aspect of um, public safety, but also on the um, proactive as far as working with our young people, uh, creating programs of nonviolence for them, working with them in terms of, of helping with jobs and educational attainment in order to um, help them to improve their quality of life. In terms of uh, the next one would be economic development. Uh, creating and bringing more businesses to the city. Uh, we, in fact, do make things in this city. We have uh, some of the biggest food manufacturers are in this city, so there are things being made in the city. Uh, last would be education. It continue to uh, support our excellent school system because that is uh, one of the main reasons why people live in or move to a community is because of the education that their children can receive. So that's very important to me. Time. Okay, I'm going to reset my clock here, and we're going to go right to the closing statements at this point, believe it or not. It's been a quick hour. So first up in the draw was uh, Chris McMillan. It was a quick hour. Uh, thank you, Ron and Mark, for moderating this debate, and thank you for the, uh, uh, the BCA for hosting this. Uh, I hope after hearing tonight that you would, you would see that I am the ch a clear choice candidate for uh, mayor of the city of Brockton, uh, that I, I am the... I will, I will tackle all the tough issues by facing the city uh, today, and we'll do so with a common sense approach. No matter what the issue, I will research both sides of the argument and make a logical and right choice for Brockton. The city deserves a mayor that will stand out and represent Brockton. I have never been one to hide. I'm not afraid to be accountable for my actions, as I know they are, will be, and are, are and will be the best interest, uh, for the best interest in the residents of Brockton. Um, so I encourage you to visit my website. It has my action plan on it. It's been up since January. Uh, my website is chrismacmillan.com for additional information. 
Uh, I hope you could research that. And I hope I can count on your vote on Tuesday, September 17th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Ron Manna. Again, thank you for providing this forum. I have outlined my common sense plan for the city. Leaders don't react, they act. When I spotted corruption in the school department, I alone, as a resident and community activist, took action while, while, while these elected officials sat back. When residential and commercial taxes got out of control, I, I co-founded Brocktonians for tax, uh, limited taxation. And as a group, we made our voices heard at City Hall. Unfortunately, they fell upon deaf ears, and this is why I'm running. Residents, we are in the position we are in because of years and years of neglect in our city. We haven't invested properly in our infrastructure. We haven't invested adequately in public safety. The other candidates are making a lot of promises. I ask you to peel back the catchphrases and look behind the large political signs. When you vote on September 17th, ask yourself, who do you trust? Ask yourself, who has respect for their neighbors in our community? Look at our track records. Who has been a fighter for you, the residents? Who has the ability to execute on plans for the future? Collectively, my opponents have had years of policy failures and personal financial failings. Again, who do you trust? Thank you. If Next you I'm not going to. Okay. If you want to see Brockton get back to government basics, away from baseball stadiums, failed water plants, and power plant quick fix schemes, you have hope for the future. I ask you to please give me your vote on September 17th and check out my website, ronmatter.org, and you'll see my plan up there and how I feel about all the other subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matter. Next would be Bill Carpenter. I guess while we're plugging the websites, I also have a website, BillCarpenterForMayor.com, and a Facebook page, Bill Carpenter for Mayor. Uh, first, thank you uh, to BCA along with uh, WXBR Radio, uh, Mark and Ron, for co-hosting tonight's uh, debate. Thank you to the fellow candidates and the mayor uh, for participating. And most importantly, thank you to the folks who are listening on the radio or watching at home on TV. I ask you for your vote on September 17th because it's time for change in the city of Brockton. It's time to get Brockton property values going back up and to get Brockton property taxes going down. It's time for Brockton residents to be at the front of the line when Brockton jobs are being filled. It's time to bring jobs and businesses back to the city of Brockton. It's time to get the illegal guns and the illicit drugs off the streets of our city. It's time to take back our neighborhoods block by block. As your mayor, we won't run a sweep once in a while to look good on the front page of the newspaper. I will relentlessly, aggressively pursue every gang leader, drug dealer, and thug every single day until we get them off of our streets and out of our neighborhoods. And for those of you in Brockton today uh, who are afraid in their own homes, who are concerned for their children's safety, who are afraid to walk down the street, hang on and vote for a change. I believe we can do better. I know we can do better. I have a blueprint for Brockton's future. It's time for change. My name is Bill Carpenter. I respectfully ask you for your vote on September 17th to serve as your next mayor. Linda Belzotti. Thank you, Mark, Ron. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Thank you to all my fellow uh, colleagues in the race. As I mentioned at the start of the evening, I'm running to continue serving as mayor because I have a passion for our city. I care about Brockton. I've spent a large part of my life standing up for our city and standing up for the right reasons. We've stood up together to build a public and private partnership to bring more than $100 million development into downtown. We've attracted new businesses like Market Basket, Crown Uniform and Linen, and the Bernardi Auto Group. And we've helped existing businesses like Evans Machine Company, WB Mason, Mattress Maker, and Cape Cod Cafe continue to grow. We have stood strong together in opposition to the power plant, and we are standing together as a community committed to strengthening public safety. We are investing in our infrastructure, in our schools, in our parks, our playgrounds, our streets, and our roads. And we are making sure to continue investing in our kids and their future. This city was not wasn't and has never been built by one person. It was built long ago by the collective efforts of many hardworking men and women, our families and our neighbors. It was built by its people steeped in traditions of hard work, hope and opportunity. This is the Brockton we know, this is our city and it's a city that's making progress. 
It is progress that has not happened overnight, and we still have more to do. But it is the work for the, our community that makes it an honor and a privilege to lead Brockton each and every day as your mayor. And I proudly ask for your vote and support on Tuesday, September 17th. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the candidates for participating. Uh, we feel this is a very important community role that Brockton Community Access in, in partnership with WXBR uh, play to let the voters know who the candidates are. Um, Ron has a few words. Well, everybody who's watching this on uh, Brockton Community Access television and listening on WXBR radio, if you reside in the city of Brockton and if you're registered to vote, you have a civic responsibility to your city to take part to make sure that you vote in the preliminary, which is very important, as well as the general election. But we're concentrating on September 17th. And find, it, find some time this time around to do a very high percentage showing at the polls on September 17th. It's your responsibility. Go out and do it this time. Very important. Couldn't agree with you more, Ron. Uh, polls are open 8 to 8 all across the city. It's very convenient to vote um, and make sure that you go there and do your civic duty. I haven't missed an election. I want to commend all the candidates for um, putting their names on the ballot, for running hard. Um, we'll go on from 4 to 2 for November, and uh, we will continue to provide coverage along with our broadcast partner, WXBR. Uh, my name is Mark Lindy. I'm the general manager here, and on behalf of my staff, crew, and board of directors, I thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.